Welcome to Toys to Men, where Michael Bay is like a Dyson. He delivers constant suction. I'm Top Gun. And I'm Lunchbox. And we're Toys, Toys to, to Men. Men. What's up, guys? It's been a while since we've done a show, but today we're going to do a review. I think of... we should explain why. We had some major technical yeah. difficulties with this JVC garbage. We have. Because the Everio, Everio. However the hell you pronounce however it. However you want to say it. The software, basically, they change something in it that's so minor it doesn't connect to YouTube anymore. So, here we are. After we finally got it sorted out, we are right. back. We are. And, uh, you know, we've been busy on our podcast, which, if you haven't checked that out, please go do that. Podomatic or iTunes. Subscribe to us, please. Also, uh, check out our website, www.toystomen.wordpress.com. Uh, we've got blogs rolling, constant news. We've got constant reviews and things and, and you know, and just the way we plan out feel about stuff. It's worth a read, absolutely. Always worth a read. Absolutely. You know, we're always keeping it constantly updated, like I just said. I can't stress that enough because if you want to know about it, it's there. It's going to be happening. So uh, come check that out. But as for the reason why we're here and doing this show right now, it's because we just witnessed Iron Man 3. My second time. My first, basically. So what's happening is we're going to do a review about it. And, uh, you know, from our, from, from the Toys to Men perspective, and, you know, just kind of speak about it a little bit, and, and there might, well, actually, there will be spoiler alerts if you haven't seen it yet. You know, it's your choice. We're going to let you know right now. We're going to talk about the full film. So, mm -hmm. if you don't want to hear about the full film yet, I hate to say it. Got to hit that turn off button. But as far as that goes, let's start off. So, basically, what happens is when, it, when the movie begins, right... It's just, I'll tell you what though, the, the, the entrance, the, the, the entrance scene was pretty cool. Uh, yeah. You know, it shows, it shows all of his suits getting exploded. I mean, it's not happening yet, you know, but it's just the entrance, you know, like out of the commercial, but it yeah. was pretty cool. It was a cool montage how they did that. The story, you know, more or less is narrated this time, which is new for the Iron Man franchise. It's narrated by Tony Stark as opposed to, you know, him just being the main character. He's actually talking about this story and... The the opening of it after, you know, this intro, you know, the introduction scene to it uh, flashes back to them in 1999 at a conference in Switzerland where he meets, and most of you that are Iron Man franchise film, you know, film fans will know, he meets Jensen, who would basically later save his life in Iron Man 1. And uh, he meets him at the conference, you know, talks to him briefly for a second, and that's pretty much it. He, uh... Comments that he finally met a man named Ho, because that was his first name. <laughs> Ho Jensen. I like that. But Jensen's uh, still pretty awesome. He looks exactly the same. It doesn't look like he's aged since Iron Man 1. So, you know, it was cool that they, you know, brought him back in for this one to kind of give him, you know, more of a backstory, I guess, really. Not so much, I guess, since he was only there for a couple minutes. But It was cool. It was, it was just cool enough that they thought it was necessary to put him in. But uh, from there, you know, you got to meet... You're going to meet the arch nemesis in this movie, um, briefly, uh, and, and the reason why they do this, this, you know, 1999 backstory is simply because this is how, and the reason why, you know, he does what he does. Right. And, uh, that's the only reason why they, you know, they go back, so, you know, he'll explain that, and, uh, from then on, uh, it's just, it's basically... I just, the concept of the movie was different than Iron Man 1 and 2. A little different than Marvel movies uh, have been in the past, I guess you could say. Uh, to me, I don't know really if it really felt, felt like a Marvel movie. Yeah, it, I don't it, it know. Didn't, it just didn't have that, that Marvel feel about it. But, I mean, you know, I'm not sitting here saying it wasn't a good movie, but it just had a different feeling to it. Yeah. It, I mean, it, it didn't feel like any Iron Man movies before it. Um, it. It could be the way they set the story up. Uh, but, you know, he his whole his whole backstory with this movie is how he created, you know, basically his demons and, you know, who come back to haunt him in right. this, you know, this movie. Um, the uh, nemesis that uh, Top Gun was talking about is uh, Aldrich Killian. 
um, you know, he he met him at this conference and told him to meet him up on a rooftop in like five minutes and never showed. Just left him standing up there. Uh, you know, you see the guy, he's he's young, but he's like crippled. Uh, comes walking in with a cane, real long he's hair, strange looking, crazy looking yeah. glasses, yeah. and just it looks like a hobo. He does. You know, I mean. He does. Uh, you know, he reaches out to Tony Stark, and, uh, you know, of course, he's a dickhead, as always. And uh, just just a way to get the guy to leave him alone, you know, he pulls him aside when everybody leaves the elevator and says, hey, look, you know, uh, I'm really interested in what you're what you're putting out there. You know, I'll meet you I'll meet you on the roof in five minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, you know, five minutes turns into several hours. He doesn't show. So that's basically the reason why they, you know, he tells he tells about that because he just created a demon uh, per se, uh, and, and and somebody that's going to come shake up his life, and, and it's pretty dramatic. But you know, after. After the the nineteen ninety nine scene rolls by, basically, you know it's modern day, and uh, he's just doing his his normal his normal Tony Stark thing, you know. Uh, it, it the movie's the movie's pretty witty, you know. I have to say, I it, there's there's a lot more humor in it than I think there was in the past movie. Yeah, this was a, definitely a funnier movie. Um, you know, when it comes to it, when it gets to you know the start of this movie, this takes place after the Avengers. Um, Tony basically has, more or less has PTSD. Uh, you know, they show flashbacks from Avengers of him, you know, when he's flying up towards the wormhole for the Chitauri. Uh, shows him, you know, firing off, you know, repulsor blasts and then, like, spinning to dodge, like, you know, what's falling. Um, you know, him carrying the nuke up into the wormhole. And, you know, just flashes back to that anytime he has a panic attack. So what he's done since then, the reason he jumped from the Mark Seven to the Mark Forty Two is he has literally poured the majority of his time into making new suits all with different you know special abilities to be ready for whatever might come right yeah he he's having a very hard time accepting what happened in the avengers movie uh you know just the whole thing about aliens and all that happened and he's he's just he's just bent by it you know and and you can really tell the whole time uh it feels like tony stark but it it doesn't feel like tony stark uh you know tony stark's always you know witty and and just you know just a normal Tony Stark way, but in, in this movie, you, you kind of, I don't know how I'm trying to say, but you kind of you kind of finally see that he you, he has a weakness. Yeah, you, you know? get like a more human side of him. Absolutely. Whereas in the first two, you know, the first two movies, he more or less thought that he, you know, was invincible as right. Iron Man. Right, And in this Cocky one... Cocky playboy. In this one, you get to see the lows right. uh, of Tony Stark. And I thought that hit pretty deep. Uh, that was one of my favorite things about this movie was just the fact that we finally got to see, you know, Tony Stark and his weakness, and uh, I thought that was necessary. Yeah. Uh, ex- especially, uh, you know, for the story. Um, you know, the story. The story wasn't. It wasn't as good as what I thought it was going to be. You know. And we'll get we'll get to why I'm saying that later, but uh, you know all around I I just can't get my grasp on how I feel about it. I can't get my grasp if I feel like you know I feel like it's it's a it's an Iron Man movie or not because it, I just can't shake the feeling that it still just didn't feel like one to me. I, I think that's really why it didn't is because you get the more you know you get more humanity out of Tony this time, right? And I think that's really why. Um, this movie kind of points to, you know, how I have been feeling the whole time about hearing the possible replacement of Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Right. This movie, I think, really kind of shows his range in the character. Like I said, the first two, you know, he was just, you know, cocky, you know, arrogant. And this one, you know, he's been basically brought down to his low point. He has to depend on others to get to where he needs to be. Like a kid, you know, for instance, he, he teams up with a boy named Harley. Uh, for a little bit, who yeah. guards the uh, Mark 42 armor for him. Young kid. Uh, probably maybe 12, probably 13. Maybe even, maybe even younger than that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's weird for me because I didn't, as, even though I didn't really like the, the main concept of the story, but before this movie happened, I really, we had a discussion on our podcast, uh, I, I didn't mind if they changed Tony Stark, really. 
You know, I didn't, I didn't mind if they did the James Bond approach, but the the way the way that Robert Downey Jr. played his character in this movie uh, single handedly was enough for me to basically protest any thought of him ever being replaced as Tony Stark in Iron Man because uh, you know he he got he got he got his ass whipped mm -hmm. a lot he did. Uh, basically nothing in this whole movie went well for him. No, not really. Uh, and, and that, and that itself is a huge change because Tony Stark basically gets what he wants, when he wants, how he wants it, and whenever he wants it. He gets his way all the time. Uh, everything's always going right for Tony Stark. Mm -hmm. He's never come up against anything like this. Right. And the Iron Man 3 storyline, uh, centers on the extremist virus and, you know, what it does in... You know what it does in the comics. You've seen it uh, in the movie. It basically lets them their bodies like superheat. Um, I can't tell you how many armors get cut through just with a hand swipe mm -hmm. of you know just anybody that's an, a, an extremist soldier more or less because they tested this on army you know um, amputees. Uh, there was a girl actually that had lost an arm. Um, I don't know what was wrong with uh, Savin. The uh, main blonde, like the main bald guy. Yeah. They didn't really show his. Yeah, they like, did. They showed they, the little, it, it was like weird, videos. though. It was kind of weird, though, because he was in the whole thing. Right. So they didn't really tell a backstory on him. So that's something that, that we kind of, you know, don't get. Uh, I thought they should have put a little bit more back to that because, you know, we still still don't know anything. I mean, he's just like a, uh, he was just a main side, uh, but we know nothing else. Right. And, um,. Basically, we see Tony's mansion get destroyed. Oh, my goodness. He, uh, well, I guess we should start with Happy. Happy uh, gets involved in a little extremist trade-off, more or less, to from Savin to another soldier. And that soldier, you know, takes his hit. Uh, basically, his body, you know, superheats, and he just explodes. And everybody that's within, you know, so many meters is just instantly vaporized. There are shadows on the wall. And, you know, Happy's lucky enough to hide behind something, so he survives and sees this Savin walk out and basically heal himself on the way out because that's another property of Extremis. He, right. You know, heals his body. He um, Actually, I think he's missing a foot, more or less, like halfway. Yeah, it, 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 it grows back. Yeah. And it's like, you know, all, like, Comes super back and it's completely heat. normal. Yeah. 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 So but he, uh, you know, Happy survives. Uh, this obviously pisses Tony off. And he issues a threat to the Mandarin, and it's a ballsy threat as he gives out his home address. Absolutely. So you can really tell, you know, how much this really kind of hit home for him since Happy's been, you know, his basically his bodyguard since Iron Man 1. Oh, he was angry, no doubt. But that's where the huge mistakes began. Right. Because after he, you know, gave that ballsy warning out and his address and basically let him know he's right there, they come right for him. It wasn't a day later, uh, and basically everything that he has worked for and, and worked towards and put together is basically gone. He has nothing left, mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's just one. You know that's just one huge effect that you see uh, on the whole character itself, and you know it's just it was just absolutely uh, it was really really you know you just had to take it in. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, wow, you know, I just can't believe this. You see everything inside just being destroyed. The armor's destroyed. The car just destroyed. Everything, you see it. You see everything he's used in the past movies and things he's, you know, he's had just get destroyed. Yeah, and everything uh, basically just crashes into the ocean. Absolutely. As long as everything just, you know, right down it goes. And it was just, you know, it was kind of hard to watch. I'm not going to lie about it. Uh, you know, you get attached to these, these characters and things, you know, and it was... It was kind of, you know, just kind of, wow. You know, one of those kind of moments where you just hit home, you know, a little bit. And and uh, it, was, it was definitely necessary for the for the point of the movie. Um, so, you know, it just hit me pretty good when that happened. So that was a good point in the movie that, you know, I feel it was necessary. It was tough to watch all the, you know, the armors from the, you know, the Mark One, Oh, yeah. The Mark Two, your suitcase suit. All of them gone. Uh, you know, the Avengers armor. All get just destroyed. Um, that was definitely hard to watch. But the uh, the Mark Forty Two that comes in is completely prehensile. He uh, injects himself basically with um, little like nano receivers that let him control it with his mind. 
and uh, puts it on without even thinking about it. Each piece is, you know, rocket propelled, and he puts them on. You know, it's really cool how he does that at first. Um, you've seen in the, you know, the posters where he's crouched down with like one fist on the ground, which came from his mask actually coming towards him and getting hit on something and flipping over completely. So at which point he basically hits a little repulsor, you know, flips over, it lands perfectly on his face, and he lands down with that fist down, which is pretty cool to watch. It's really cool. I mean, that's the first time you get to see the Mark 42 on. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, the Mark 42 armor, though, uh, you know, like we've already talked about, it's not a conventional Iron Man movie at all. Uh, you basically get to see him in the armor, what, three times? Yeah, in the Mark 42, I think. And wearing it. Uh, two of which, it just... Uh, you know, falls off of him. Yeah. In some in some manner, it's, it's like, I guess you could say it's clumsy, which is a weird word to say for armor, but yeah, it, I the, mean, it more or less falls to pieces. Like it, it does, it just breaks. It just hits and breaks open. Yeah. He basically, you know, comes out with like a double chop at one point and it just falls apart. Yeah. It grabs. It grabs. It grabs Pepper. You know, as a defense mechanism. You know, and he was having a bad dream and she kind of grabbed onto him and it, come over and just snatched her, and uh, you know. That's not, you know, he, he wants nothing more in life than her to be safe. So, you know, he kind of chops it down and just drops into pieces. But basically the whole movie, that's what's happening. Yeah. And he's not, and he's controlling the suit with his mind somewhere else. 90% of the time that the suit is actively doing anything in the movie itself. Right. So, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how, how I really felt about that because... You don't really get to see much suit action, yeah. There's at all, which I guess there's more him without a suit on. Yeah, getting his ass whipped. Which it, it points back to us saying about the humanity thing. Like, yeah, at this point he has nothing to rely on. Uh, he doesn't even have Jarvis at one yeah. point. Yep. He's completely. It's he has and, the kid. It's him and Harley. That's it. That's right. And uh, luckily for him, the kid he stumbles on happens to be pretty tech savvy as well. Yeah, I like the little character though. I would say that it was kid. It was it was a cute role. I liked it. Uh, it was pretty cool. I enjoyed that. That kid was good. I don't he know his was name, good. but he was he yeah, was he good. Was good. Uh, I just really, really enjoyed that. I thought that it was perfect. You know? Yeah. I mean, it was cool. You I know, he it. he ends up, you know, basically crash landing in Tennessee after escaping what happens at his home. Uh, meets Harley. Harley looks after the suit and everything for him, and gets to the point actually where he repairs Jarvis, and, and you know, he's got the suit there charging. Uh, basically, they get repowered the Mark Forty Two, and um, all the while this is happening, they have multiple threats from well, actually multiple attacks from the Mandarin, which is who we're gonna get into right now. <laughs> uh, definite spoilers if you haven't turned off already and you don't want to know about the Mandarin. Do not finish watching this. Do not watch this section right now. Um, we're not trying to get you people to leave, but. We're just letting you know, you know, we're going to spill the beans on this whole Mandarin deal. Right, we don't want to ruin it for you, and if you haven't seen it, you really should watch it, because aside from this, it is a good movie. Um, this might be enough to absolutely make people either not watch it, or basically get up and walk away. Right. That's what this could do right here. Uh, well, <laughs> how do we start? Uh, the Mandarin is basically the face of a visionary's crime. Uh, him not being the visionary, of course, but the face. Uh, they felt that there was it was necessary to have you know an ego, I guess you could say, uh, you know, a face that looked like. You know, he meant business. I guess, I guess you could say it like that. Someone really like, you know, to be the face of something like this to take, you know, credit for these crimes. Right. They actually compare, you know, that to basically painting a target on them, like they did, like you know, we've done with, you know, Bin Laden and um, you know things like that. Yeah. Um, having basically, you know, a face to go along with all these crimes. Right. And um, the face that they choose. Um, as you know, is Ben Kingsley, who's a phenomenal actor, and he... <laughs> it's funny because he's actually like Robert Downey Jr. in Tropic Thunder. He's a dude... Awful movie. ...that's playing a dude disguised as another dude. 
Yeah, it's a good way to put it. I never thought about that. Yeah, it's a good way to put that. But the Mandarin that you see in the film is supposed to be basically the head of the Ten Rings, which is the terrorist organization from the first movie that captured Tony. And he doesn't really exist. Yeah. um, Like, there's three videos, I believe, right? There's There's three clips, you know, like terrorist clips. And, and boy, are they awesome. They they make they him out to be the most badass comic villain I think I've seen brought to life in a movie. The look... Yeah, that's exactly it. He's the best looking villain I think we've ever seen in a Marvel movie. His voice is perfect. The voice, the look, the the just the hand actions, the facial actions, the the body chemistry is so spot on. And then... He's not... He's not even... He's not even real. The Mandarin's real name in this? Trevor Slattery. He's basically an English actor. Um, Who's hooked on pills. Yeah. Has a substance problem, as he put it. They basically offered him all the pills he wanted to be the face of this crime. Yeah. he, he, uh, uh, you know, accepted, of course. Right. He He likes to get high. He tells Tony about it. You know, Tony confronts him. Yeah, yeah. this This is where it's it right now. Tony busts in, and there's two chicks on the bed. And you hear the toilet flush. And you're thinking, oh, my God, you know, oh, my God, here we go. Dude walks out just like the little, like, he just walks out in, like, a robe with his little, he got a little weird got, swag like, on. He's like, pajama pants He's, on like, himself. pajama pants. Look, oh, you know, he's got this, like, look like he wouldn't hurt a fly, and he's, he's double-fisted Budweiser's. <laughs> he's <laughs> definitely putting him down. He, he's just doing a job, you know? And uh, he doesn't, he, Tony pops out. You know, he just doesn't even sound like he has a different voice. He basically puts a gun in this guy's face and the guy shits himself. He's like, whoa, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Like, it's just a whole different voice from, from the Mandarin. He, and then he further explains he's an actor getting paid in booze and pills through the face of this crime. And a lovely speedboat. And a very lovely speedboat. That's which turns out to be not even a speedboat, but just a boat. Like, the boat they're on is not even close to being a speedboat. Yeah, it's, it's just a very nice boat. It's almost like the boat from Jaws. It is. Except newer. It is, you're right. But, uh, yeah, so that's how that character breaks down. Uh, we finally see a just diabolical villain that is actually going to be, like, the best villain, like you just said. I'm telling you. The I, best villain yet. I was so... And it was fake. So pumped for the Mandarin. Like You don't even understand... I I was so I was so disappointed. Like it was so disappointing. Yeah. That, it was awful. I mean that that really would be enough for somebody to not want to see it. Oh, um, especially real Iron Man fans, you know what I mean? Like yeah. and see that that's what's sad is I I guess I just tolerate some things better than others, but like as we talked before and as most people out there should know already, Iron Man is my favorite Marvel hero and I was disappointed by this, but it's not enough for me to not recommend it to someone, and it's not enough for me to not watch it probably again. I've seen it twice already, last night and tonight, Saturday, of course, Friday and Saturday. But I've seen it twice, and I, like I said, I would recommend everybody at least give it a shot and watch it and see what you think. Um, even if you have not seen it and are still paying attention at this point, and you know what we've talked about with the Mandarin, it's still worth it because Ben Kingsley still kind of, you know, Pulls off this whole bumbling idiot character, you know, that's not the Mandarin. That's exactly, that's the perfect way to put it. A bumbling yeah. idiot. Tony refers to him as Lawrence Oblivier. Basically, <laughs> meaning he, he has no, you know, no idea what's going on. But, um, you know, he uh, he does pull that off well, which is not surprising because it is Ben Kingsley. But still, it's not the Mandarin that we're looking for. And we're not going to get it really, because this was his only appearance. Yeah. They're not going to retcon him, you know, anything like that. Well, they basically it? pulled an Origins Deadpool with Mandarin in a less disappointing fashion, but still disappointing nonetheless. Oh. Hey, look, it, it, it honestly kills me because the look was so spot on. We finally, finally saw a spot on fill-in, and it was just... I, the main the main bad guy of this movie, the main villain, is, you know, the guy we was telling you about in the beginning in his flashback. 
I just thought that just that just uh, it missed the mark. He, yeah, he it basically there. missed the mark. Yeah. Uh, if there was a full on Mandarin attack, and we got to see, uh, you know, the Iron Patriot, and uh, you know, Tony and which Tony Stark is not a fan of. By the way, he does yeah. not care for the rebrand. Basically, you get to see the basically you get to see that suit for I'm gonna say in a two hour and ten minute movie. You basically get to see it probably on screen for uh, let's say twenty five minutes. And I don't think it fires a shot. It does not fire a shot. And a matter of fact, twelve of the twelve minutes of the twenty five minutes, he's not even he's not it. even wearing it. Uh, so there is basically no no real suit action. There's not really any real fight scenes, really. Uh, there's plenty of fight scenes, don't get me wrong, but there's no real Iron Man fight scenes. Yeah. Uh, if they would have, if they would have had man, if, if Mandarin was real, we could have had epic battles with the Iron Patriot and Iron Man, and it just would have been all out fantastic. Or if yeah. not multiple, at least one good showdown. At least one good showdown. Which, but we didn't get that at all. As a matter of fact, we got a subpar villain that's who was just another extremist soldier. Basically, Aldrich that, Killian has the extremist virus, and that's that's basically it. Um, the ending, the end fight scene of the movie with him and Tony was pretty cool, but it's it's in again another like negative for me because the whole time the Iron Man suits put up and take so much devastating fire and this this 3000 degree temperature that they can just mold their arm into basically just f- cuts it right in half like it's a piece of paper more suits get destroyed in this movie than you would ever imagine yeah. i'm talking you get to see at least 10 12 suits get demolished just destroyed yeah and this one movie which is bad because well, they put up nothing. They, it's it's like well, this. They, they built these suits up so much. Yeah. Like you know, there was a thing on Facebook, uh, the Hall of Armor, that they you know told you about a new armor like every week. You you get to see basically the two that were mentioned by name, uh, Red Snapper and Heartbreaker. Basically, Red Snapper is getting attacked by like three different extremist soldiers, and these are they're basically controlled by. The, the suits themselves are controlled by Jarvis, is where I'm, what I'm getting yeah, from. Yeah, you're exactly right. While the Mark 42 is basically linked directly to Tony. Um, but he has all these other suits coded only to him. And, you know, he tells Heartbreaker to help Red Snapper. Well, Heartbreaker takes off maybe two of the soldiers, but another one rips the face right off of, yeah. you know, right off of Red Snapper, and he's gone. And Red Snapper was one I was looking forward to the most because I liked that body style. Five seconds of him. And the shotgun armor they showed on Facebook that was cool, didn't even really see that one that nope. I'm aware of. Nope. Um, every, and, armor that, every armor they talked about you saw for three seconds and it was destroyed. And that was, you know, the longest time you saw them was when they all flew up, you know, around where they're supposed to be. Yep. That was it. Yep. Um, it was kind of cool, though, how we brought him in because he asked Jarvis if it was that time. And uh, Jarvis replies, uh, "You mean house party time?" <laughs> so that was kind of cool. But um, it's just not one of those, not one of those things that I was real happy with with the movie. Is I was looking forward to seeing, you know, him and at least some of these new armors. And the big thing that really got us that we talked about was the fact that there was no Hulkbuster. Well, I don't think it's time for the Hulkbuster. Which I do believe that blue suit, the big blue suit. He called the, it like Eeyore or something. I know. I like, thought it was the Ironmonger suit, but I'm guessing it's probably not. But that was my closest guess to what it was supposed to represent. Because I don't ever believe we'll see that, no. that suit. Uh, I do believe we'll see a Hawkbuster, but I will say one thing. Uh, after, after the Avengers and Spider-Man, the Amazing Spider-Man movies, uh, you know... This was supposed to be the best Marvel movie uh, to date, and uh, unfortunately for me, it missed a mark on uh, many, many. Uh, it just, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm a little disappointed about it. Uh, I won't go back and see it again. I will, however, buy it. 
I'll buy it only for the fact that I own all the other ones. Well, all Marvel movies. I even own Daredevil and Electra. Sorry. I do. I know. On Blu-ray. But it is what it is. I'm a collector and that's what I do. So I will buy it just to add. And I'll probably watch it again on, on Blu-ray. But as far as going back, I don't think so. Uh, I just thought it was, it just hit, it just missed too many marks for me. And uh, it just didn't, it didn't live up to the hype, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's supposed to be the best, hands down, Iron Man movie. I don't think it was that. It was supposed to be the best Marvel movie to date. It definitely wasn't that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as for my review, I'm going to throw it a 7 out of 10. Uh, just missed a mark for me. Um, I'd probably have to give it an 8, uh, just due to the fact of, you know, like we talked about how well Tony portrays, you know, this broken down version of, or Robert Downey Jr. portrays this whole broken down version of Tony Stark, and, you know, the way he reacts to having to rely on people, he's not as much of a dick as you think he would be. Um, he does kind of have some, like, cross things to say to this kid, but in the end, um, you know, really appreciates the help, you know, that he gave him. And that kid comes home from school one day and sees his entire little workshop area that has been basically refitted Stark industry style. Absolutely. Uh, brand new monitor. There's a pop machine in there, like a cooler. Oh, There's a got uh, top, top tech technology. Like a 66, what, yeah. Mustang there was in there? a 66 there. Fastback Mustang. It was just, it needed restored. It was just all broken down and just destroyed. He When he comes back... The car has been restored and it's uh, you know 100 percent fresh. It's just it's just really cool. It was a smile moment, I guess, at the end to say uh, I really enjoyed the interaction with him and the kid. It was really cool. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. Um, there was things I did enjoy in this movie. I, I thought I thought Robert Downey Jr. I thought his acting in this movie was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I gained a new respect for him uh, as the Iron Man character. I just wanted to see more Iron Man feel. Yeah. And that's what lacked for me. And, of course, the seven I gave it earlier was from, you know, Mandarin being a fake. I mean, yeah. who in the hell would ever even imagine that? That was a left field.